Welcome back to the Daily Dope. I'm your host, Brando, the Weed Commando. And this is uh, part of a new thing I'm doing. It's not really new, I guess. I've been making videos. I've, I've made a few videos about activists in the cannabis community over the last couple years since I've had this channel going. Um, and this is just... Uh, kind of like a beginning of a new chapter of that where I'm going to really just start making these videos from time to time uh, to profile some of the people that got us to where we are now, you know. Um, and the Rainbow Farm incident in Michigan, in case you didn't know about it already, is a catalyzing event that had to happen, I guess, you know, in the um, <clears throat> to to prove how insane the drug war really is, you know, somebody had to actually die for the cause, um, and in this case, as you're going to find out, if you don't know about what happened <clears throat> on Rainbow Farm or anything about it, um, it, basically it's a forfeiture, uh, situation that kind of escalated things, um, and there was a subsequent drug raid where they arrested, uh, I think, five people at the farm and found uh, upwards of 300 marijuana plants growing, which wasn't a very smart idea, I guess you could say. Um, now, I'm going to go over some material that I have on Rainbow Farm and maybe comment on some of it to try to illustrate what was going on there and how this uh this happened how the fbi um sniper shot and killed the proprietors of the farm uh tom and raleigh um and basically i'm gonna i'm gonna share some material that i've found about it um it's pretty much all there is if you dig into the internet and i have a bunch of links that i will share where you could you know, go further into, uh, into the story if you want to. Um, and there is a book which is by Dean Kuypers and is a very, very well written account of what went down. And, uh, basically besides that, there is also an abbreviated version of the, the events that happened that he wrote that was published in Playboy magazine in 2003 there's a link to that also below, um, and that link is also provided on this uh, website here, Rainbow Farm, which is uh, www.rainbowfarmcamp.com, which was originally the site for Rainbow Farms, but, you know, all the stuff that happened, now it's a memorial site, and there's, there's not a whole lot to it, but it, it can get you started, so... I'm going to go ahead and just start going through the material, and I guess to bring us up to date with the situation, the most recent um, headline, I guess you could call it, coming out of uh, Rainbow Farm is that it is going to be made into a movie, and that is the book Burning Rainbow Farm by Dan Kuypers, um, and the news of this broke uh, in May of uh, 2017 <clears throat> and to be honest I've been keeping up on this and there's really no updates on the uh, on the uh, progress of the movie so that uh, is something I'll probably update later on as soon as I find out about it um, so we're going to go ahead and watch this clip here from uh, Channel 3 News and this is Western Michigan a deadly standoff at a former campground in Cass County will be the topic of a major motion picture. Yeah, that campsite was known as Rainbow Farm. It was also at the center of a marijuana legalization movement. News Channel 3's Cody Combs spoke with the author of a book about Rainbow Farm and about the potential movie deal in the works. Cody. Andy and Kate, the title of the book the movie will be based on is Burning Rainbow Farm. It takes a look at the actions the FBI took during that week of September 2001 at the campground in Newburgh Township. The author tells me a production company and a director have signed on to make a movie about that tense-filled week WWMT covered back in 2001. 
Over 130 law enforcement members were brought in with tanks, helicopters, and weapons. I can't believe they've done it. I can't believe they killed him. What happened here? Who gave the who made the decision? Who gave the orders? And during that week-long standoff, the owners and operators of the farm, Tom Crossland and Rollin Rome, began to burn the farm down and refused to come out of their home. They armed themselves as FBI agents and Michigan State Police pursued their arrests. This came after weeks of tension between the Rainbow Farm owners and the county prosecutor at the time, who said Rainbow Farm violated Michigan law by growing marijuana on the farm. Both men were eventually shot and killed by FBI agents. The author of this book, Dean Kuyper, says there's renewed interest in this deadly incident because of all the discussion about marijuana legalization. Everybody, especially when the current climate about marijuana, everybody knows that you're not like two people aren't supposed to die because of their stance about whether or not you can smoke weed. And in the end, that actually is what happened. And Kuyper says prominent director Lenny Abramson has signed on to direct this movie, but he warns because it's in early productions, any certain dates, he can't quite predict those quite yet. For now, the I-Team is looking into this deadly standoff with Freedom of Information Act request to both the FBI and Michigan State Police. We'll be sure to keep you posted as we keep investigating this story. Live in the newsroom, I'm Cody Combs. And uh, so, yep, that's... That's what you need to know about the movie. And there was a little bit of details about the story there. Um, I'm just going to talk about what happened there for a little bit here. Um, basically, uh, this party over right here in the lower west side of Michigan basically... Um, <clears throat> was kind of a legendary party in the Michigan marijuana legalization movement scene. Um, we already had the hash bash, which a lot of people attended at the time. It was like a 5,000 person party, but that was more of a public party and there wasn't really a lot of, you know, bands or whatever. I mean, it, it wasn't a central thing and it you know it basically wasn't uh the same kind of party i guess you'd call it but anyway i've only i only remember going to the rainbow farm one time and just due to the fact that when i was that was when i was a little younger um i wasn't able to get out and about i didn't have transportation figured out quite as good as i do nowadays i guess um, but anyway, I'm not, you know, I don't have any inside knowledge of what was going on. I was kind of a low key person back then as far as, uh, you know, what I, what I was basically able to do as far as in the legalization movement, I was kind of more just in the background. Um, and quite frankly, I wish I could have went to more of those parties, to be honest, it, look, it was a really good vibe. I remember that. Um, and, you know, they had good speakers. I remember seeing Jack Herrer there. Uh, <laughs> I never met Tom or Raleigh that I know of. Um, and really, I don't really remember much about the whole thing. But I do remember when it happened. Uh, it kind of, it was like a blip on the radar of like whoa you know because we're, we're just during the time a lot of people listening to this might not realize that there was kind of a a lot of tension between the federal government and militia movements and um, just all kinds of things where if you know if if you had a, a bunch of guns and a compound or some kind of property where you know the cops had some kind of contention with you it was like, you know, there was a lot of focus on it. So we had Waco, we had Ruby Ridge, um, and this was kind of like right along the same lines, you know. Uh, <clears throat> and quite frankly, it, it really shouldn't have been that way. I mean, I don't know, I, I really don't know um, anybody that, personally knows Tom or Raleigh either or knew them um 
but it seems like that especially Tom it seems like once they said that they were going to take the property and then Raleigh when they said when they went ahead and um took his son into custody uh that pretty much set in motion like these guys resolve was basically uh guaranteed that they would take it to the final conclusion um so i don't know um here's the book burning rainbow farm highly recommend it uh dean kuipers he he do, he did a great job of researching and talking to people and it's just a all around great read and uh a excellent account of the events that happened and then <clears throat> larry abramson uh irish director kind of famous for a couple movies um frank in 2014 and then Ro- Ro- the room or just room i mean in 2015 so, <clears throat> as soon as we get more on that, and it's got an IMDb page, but there's no updates. So, as soon as we get more on that, we'll let you know. <clears throat> if you look around for news articles about this, uh, you might end up stumbling into this. September 4th, 2001, CNN archive article. And um, I guess I'll read this, but I don't... I I read it with caution because after looking at all the material I've seen, I kind of feel like, you know, maybe, maybe the story, the official narrative that we heard on this story, maybe it's not what they say happened. It's hard to say. Um, but this is, uh, Vandalia, Michigan, Vandalia, Michigan, which is also, by the way, a famous stop on the Underground Railroad town in Michigan. Just thought I'd throw that in there. I, uh, I really don't know any other reason why anybody would know about Vandalia, Michigan. So an FBI agent shot and killed a campground owner who had been involved in a four-day standoff with police, according to a statement released by the FBI. When they say campground owner, I mean, he had already started, I think they started this party at that at the farm there in either 1994 or five and you know for five six seven years almost they had these parties there with campers and it was three parties a year (laughs) memorial day labor day and 420 by the time it was over so it was a pretty well established thing um and then back to the article well this is the article according to the fbi Detroit office Tom Croslin 46 was shot when he raised a weapon to his shoulder and aimed it at the agent another man received what the FBI called minor injuries the FBI referred to the agent as an observer police and the FBI say that they tried for four days to talk with Croslin who along with two other people who hold up in the property after sheriff's deputies responded to reports of gunfire at the campground when the deputies arrived Friday, they found several structures on fire, and authorities said Croslin began shooting at them as they attempted to approach. Neighbors told police Croslin had warned all hell was going to break loose, and officials evacuated nearby residents. Croslin and five others had been arrested in May after a two-year investigation just prior to a weekend event promoting marijuana legalization. A legal forfeiture proceeding had been initiated on the property in May. <clears throat> Um, just real quick, the two year investigation thing was really just two years of the prosecutor teeter, just trying to, um, basically try to trip them up or whatever. Like he really had nothing. There was an IRS investigation on certain petty things that were going on, like not reporting, uh, people that worked at the 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 general store or there was another coffee shop or whatever so people that worked at these little shops on the on the campsite were somehow you know not getting uh their wd their w4s or whatever they didn't claim them on taxes somehow and there was other issues that were minor but with taxes that apparently 
was one reason why you know and, and basically besides that there was just all these other um attempts by teeter to try to like trip him up on some kind of drug deals and then to the point where they just had police busting people on the way in and out of these parties just to either scare people from even coming or actually make arrests and for drugs and confiscate people's property and stuff so you know it was just all around uh a, a hostile environment to be having parties in uh, overall with this prosecutor on uh Croslin's ass the whole time now this is what was the big deal the bullet stuck in the helicopter um, in South Bend, Indiana, said its news helicopter was shot at and damaged Friday as it flew over the scene to cover the fires. Now, the fires was the fires that uh, Tom Croslin lit. Um, he basically wanted to destroy all the structures that they had on, had built on the property. Um, sheriff's officials notified area airport control towers Friday to keep off keep aircraft out of this area after several gunshots were also fired at an unmarked Michigan State Police aircraft and a civilian aircraft. <clears throat> Later that day, a warrant was issued for Croslin's arrest when he failed to make a scheduled court appearance in connection with the prior drug charge. An official with the sheriff's office said authorities were going to revolt Croslin's bond because they suspected he was involved in drug activity. The FBI gave this account of the shooting. Croslin and a man named Brandon Peoples left Croslin's residence Monday night after negotiations with law enforcement negotiators broke down. Quote, they approached an area where an FBI observer had been stationed, and upon seeing the FBI observer, Croslin immediately raised his weapon to his shoulder height and pointed it directly at the agent. At the moment, the FBI observer fired one round and fatally wounded Croslin, with Brandon Peoples receiving minor injuries. Third man, Roland Eugene Rome, remains inside Croslin's residence at, and FBI agents are negotiating for his surrender. Um, and then the next day they, they flushed him out and subsequently shot him, saying he raised his rifle. Uh, I guess it's really just... You just have to believe the FBI's word and the police's word and maybe this Brandon Peoples character's word that, you know, Tom or Raleigh raised their rifles. You just really have to take their their words into account. We don't have video evidence. We don't know what's going on. We just, we're just, this is just what they're saying happened. Um, and as far as the bullets and you know the shooting at the aircraft overall that's another thing that that's what got the fbi there in the first place i believe was the aviation it was you know that's a federal offense to to fire on a, on something in the, that's flying around in the sky i guess so yeah and um yes there will be a link to this too it's the the, the shortened account that was published in playboy uh it's called siege at rainbow farm and uh it's a really good detailed account so if you're into reading and you don't feel like reading a whole book which i highly recommend the book but if you you know if that's just not your thing but you can read something that's in the neighborhood of 6500 words then this is your uh hookup right here it'll give you a lot of details and i'm not going to talk about it on this video and uh let's see here All right, I got a couple of videos. The first video I have, which I have edited a little bit, um, it has, uh, this is like a video, little documentary that Tom Hager made back at Hemp Aid 99. Um, <clears throat> and basically you're going to see kind of like a, a little, you know, drive around with Tom. Um, and then you're going to see the campground and maybe some people talking about that uh the band playing on the stage is going to be the high times cannabis cup band um and 
this is basically uh, a pretty good, quick little snapshot of what was going on at the time. And yeah, here we, I'm just gonna go ahead and play it. Nobody in America even has a chance anymore. The laws, they, they train our police, the people that are there to serve and protect us, to circumvent your civil liberties by searching you at any, any whim while you're going down the road. You know, what's, what's that for, man? We have secret police. That's going to be part of our program here with our campaign for sheriff in this county is that we're going to do away with secret police. If that man is going to take a county paycheck to serve us, he's going to wear a uniform. He's going to be proud to. There won't be any more undercover crap. And uh, our cooperation with the state and federal authorities at that point will depend on their attitudes and their, their, as far as them wanting to be with our mark guys. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we need cops. We can't live without them, but they got to start working for us instead of the government. That's not an option. <laughs> it's no longer an option in America. They pushed it. They've gone too far. They've just gone too far. People are here, but it's almost full. Okay. And uh, the music's been really good, and the people are amazing. The vending scene is really amazing. Um, found some really nice homemade, uh, handmade um, jewelry and clothes. I'm strutting now. What, Jerry, for you? Tommy! You want to hit some hash, man? Yeah. How many times have you been to Rainbow Farm? Oh, this is my I first time I'm right coming back for I've, uh, I'm bringing my kids, I spoke my kids a little earlier, so. It's be great. I'm, um, I'm on a time release. I got every movie, every movie. <laughs> <laughs> I was walking along M140 in Michigan, outside of Waterville, when a guy that was drinking and driving left Berrien Springs after a golf outing and ran me down. I've been everywhere for my headaches, from the Mayo Clinic to the University of Michigan, the Diamond Headache Clinic. I'm a walking medical mystery. They really don't, can't classify my kind of headaches because I took such a severe hit to my head. But anyway, I was sitting at home one time, and like I said before, I was taking up to 25 pills a day of different kinds of drugs. I was going sideways. I was, they had me on there, so much stuff. But anyway, a partner of mine uh, was watching me take all these pills, and he said, hey, Bill, I know something that'll probably help you with your headaches because it helps me with mine. And he introduced me to the medicine cigarette, as I call it, a joint to everybody else. You know, just by the simple fact, all these people show up to this because they know this is a rare spot in America to be free. You know, I mean, they, they know it's, it's very rare. Just pockets of it are still marsh anymore, and we want to dig it out and uh, make it more usable. And, you know, it's wonderful. We're going to stock it with fish. I'm going to go buy a few of them big old 100-pound catfish out of Mississippi just to keep them boys on their toes around here. <laughs>
That's a little bit of hippie magic. So I want to. I hope you can make this a, a tradition too, that we do a circle on Sunday at sunset. And it goes down with the hippie slide and all the other great things you're developing here. So thanks very much for coming out. And High Times is coming back because we had a wonderful time. I love you all, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Mr. Steve Hager from High Times Magazine. Let's give it up. Remember it was on the descent of the tree. So that's the big challenge to me. That's why we want to legalize marijuana. That's what we say. Hey, no. Um, so yeah, that was Steve Hager's video that he has <clears throat> on a little, uh, page where he had a little retrospective about Rainbow Farm and Tom, uh, and Raleigh. Um, uh, and I got one more video and this is from Dean Kuyper's own, uh, YouTube channel. And on this video you have, uh, it's going to start with um, John Sinclair, another activist from Michigan, who also sort of, in a way, martyred himself by uh, lighting a joint on the Capitol steps in Lansing right around the time Nixon uh, declared marijuana public enemy number one, pretty much. So you'll see him talking. You'll see Adam Brook, another activist in Michigan, um, he used to, uh, do the can or do the hash bash party in, in Ann Arbor, which is also basically the center of the legalization movement always has been, um, since John Sinclair got arrested, basically the hash bash started in Ann Arbor and has been going ever since. So it's pretty much as old as I am, um, and then you'll also hear, of course, from Dean Kuypers himself, who was speaking at the 2006 um, Hemp Fest in Seattle. Uh, and again, I edited the video a little bit, um, but just I'm just adding these videos for perspective on, you know, just to give everybody a little bit of perspective on what was going on there. Uh, the drugs are on, the drugs are on, yeah. Oop. <laughs> you know, the Rainbow Farm incident, this is one of the ugliest things that I uh, that's ever happened in my lifetime. It's just such an awful, ugly thing. Two guys try to be activists in Michigan. They lose their farm. They lose their legal, you know, business. They lose their son, and then they lose their lives, just because of you know marijuana. It was part of this historical thing in Michigan of people trying to go beyond the envelope and do interesting things like we used to do in the 60s and 70s. Here these guys were in the 90s, you know. Five years later, we have Burning Rainbow Farm. This story should have been wrapped up at the five-year point. It's now just starting to be told. And that's why the book's so important, is because this story has not been told. We are backstage right now at the main stage at the Seattle Hemp Fest. As John Sinclair told me, all good people, not like they say. I want you to give a warm Seattle welcome to Dean Kuypers. He came a long way. All right, thank you, Debbie and hello, from Seattle Hemp Fest. Uh, this is a story of two guys named Tom Croslin and Raleigh Rome who gave their lives in the war on drugs, literally. So this is a forfeiture story. I don't, probably all of you are familiar with the idea of drug asset forfeiture, but if they bust you for drugs, a lot of times they can take things from you. They can take the farm where you live, they can take your car that you're driving in, they can take a lot of stuff. But in 2001, Tom and Raleigh grew some weed in their basement. Probably not a very smart thing to do for two guys who are at that point the leaders and, and, and the two most prominent you know, hemp activists in the state of Michigan, but they did. And uh, three months later, they had their first uh, hearing for the forfeiture proceedings, uh, which were going forward. And basically that day, August 31st, they were going to lose their farm. And Tom and Raleigh said, well, but over our dead body. And they, that morning, they burned Rainbow Farm to the ground. That turned into a standoff. Uh, the FBI arrived on the scene, and they put snipers in the woods. 
Uh, they put snipers on Tom's own property. And while he was walking back from the neighbor's house with a puffy pot one day with his rifle in his hand, he encountered three of these agents who jumped out from behind a tree and promptly shot him in the forehead. This is the, the devastating effects of what, you know, of, of the, the depth of the prosecutors and the DA's tool bag, you know, like what, all the stuff they can actually use against you in the United States of America. They come in, they take your property, they take your child, they close your legal business, they can stop him fest like this, and then they can kill you. You have to imagine the shock on the, uh, for people who used to go to a place like Rainbow Farm when this is what they did there. Like, this is the crime. The crime was they walked around, they looked at bongs, you know, they bought a really badly screen printed t-shirt, and they listened to some people speaking, they're exercising their First Amendment right to tell you about weed, and then they come in and they kill the guys. After making a fair amount of money in the real estate market down in Elkhart, Indiana, Tom Croslin, um, and his lover, Raleigh Rome, uh, bought 54 acres in Michigan, pretty beautiful spot. It became like this sort of community collective right away. By 97, uh, it was a pretty big festival. They had two a year called Hemp Aid and Roach Roast, and they would have three to 5,000 people come out. You know, pretty soon they started booking like Big Brother and the Holding Company, Merle Haggard, Tommy Chong. It was really getting some notoriety. Um, and the local prosecutor there, uh, who was trying to do what probably any prosecutor would do in his situation is, is control it or try to figure out some way to not let drugs sort of blow all over his county, started sending uh, letters to Tom. He didn't ever really go talk to him or anything. He just like, would send him these terse little letters that were like one paragraph. And in 99, he sent him a letter that got, really got under Tom's skin that said, actually, I'll take the farm. This made Tom furious, and he was just he was the kind of guy who would fight anything. I saw this story in the Kalamazoo Gazette in 2001, just um, the, basically a week after it happened in the Sunday Gazette. And I knew I had to write about this right away because it was my home community. These guys stood up for something they believed, and they really martyred themselves. In my view, they martyred themselves. Of all people I've ever known, they martyred themselves. And then they were blacked out by the 911 uh, bombing. CNN was out there, Rolling Stone had a guy out there, all the wire services were out there, TV people were out there like crazy. Um, but then 9-11 happened, and then it all just went away. The whole drug war toolkit that's available to a prosecutor was designed to get the bad guys. You know, Colombian drug lords, you know, organized crime. That, so there's things like forfeiture that they can use because somebody's running cocaine in from Colombia, they can seize the boat. But for a guy like Tom Croslin, who's trying to change the pot laws in the open and running a ballot initiative and stuff in Michigan, you take his farm, I don't think that the, the community is really behind the idea that, oh, yeah, we should snuff that guy out and take his farm and take his child and, and, and that th those laws were on the books and you should use them against a guy like that who's trying to talk to the community. And, um, yeah, <clears throat> that's kind of, uh, how, how I feel about how pretty much everybody feels about this incident is, you know, like no matter what <clears throat> happened, no matter how this got to where it got, do you really want to be the one that's known as, you know, the guy that is behind why these two men were shot <laughs> and killed by FBI snipers on their own property. I mean, it's it's one of the most um, unbelievable things that has ever happened in in the marijuana um, legalization movement, really. And it's really hard to to grasp what that meant to the you know, the movement, what that meant to the festival scene in Michigan at the time. And, I mean, I, I, I just recently went to a festival in Michigan, which was the Electric Forest, which started about seven years after this incident happened. Uh, and it was called Rothbury when it started. And kind of like right off the bat, the first 
thing they did is invite the cops to come and oversee the party and make sure, you know, hey, you can watch people coming through the gate. You can watch people coming through into the venue, getting searched both times. You can watch people, you know, watch, make sure the vendors are all legitimate and they're not selling drugs or whatever. And, you know, all the, all the things that happened with Rainbow Farm was because the cops never actually had anybody in there other than undercover narcs just trying to bust people. Um, but they basically just uh, sat outside the perimeter and this prosecutor, Teeter, would just write letters to Tom. And then it finally culminated one day when Tom decided to write him a letter back. And in the letter that he wrote back... Um, he he kind of it wasn't really too threatening but it kind of had some loosely made threats about you know if you if you try to take the farm or if you try to invade the farm or whatever and he kind of alluded to the fact that he had uh Michigan militia um people that the Michigan militia basically was helping do guarding the parties security and whatnot and like I said before, they at the time, militias, especially the Michigan militia, which was loosely connected to the Oklahoma City bombing, um, because Terry Nichols, apparently his brother, was a member of the Michigan militia. So what we have is just basically like, uh, at the time, the atmosphere between the federal government, especially the FBI and the ATF, and militia groups were pretty hostile towards each other at the time. Um, you know, militia groups were bantering on about Waco and Ruby Ridge, quite rightfully so, you know, like... <clears throat> and then all this all this happened, um, and it sh sent shockwaves through the legalization movement, of course, and in Michigan, and... Then 9-11 happened and kind of it immediately fell into the, the memory hole. So I guess that's why a lot of people these days probably never even heard of Rainbow Farm or the incident that took the lives of two activists in Michigan. Um, and to kind of top that all off, uh, you know, just seven years after it happened, uh, Michigan decided it was time to legalize medical marijuana. And I don't know if the movement, you know, the movement continued to do whatever it was doing already during Rainbow. And every year at Hash Bash that I remember going to it, there was always somebody with some kind of petitions uh, to do something for marijuana. <laughs> I mean, activists have always been very active in Michigan. And because, for good reason, um, we got our, you know, first taste of activism with uh, John Sinclair. You know, right when Nixon declared uh, Schedule One, boom, we have activism. Uh, and Michigan's been one of the states that has enforced the marijuana laws very fervently um, and has made you know, examples out of people like John Sinclair where they gave him 10-year sentence for, for possession of two joints. <laughs> Unbelievable. He ended up doing two of those years, too. So, when all is, when, you know, all in all, that's basically um, what I got for this story. And uh, the links below will let you know anything, you know, if you want to get more in-depth I highly recommend reading this book, Burning Rainbow Farm, by Dean Kuypers. Mm -hmm. And, yep, I <clears throat> would have to say that, you know, everybody's asking my opinion about the legalization question in November. And, again, if you want to know why I think it's going to be a win and I think it's going to be a landslide is because there's still a lot of people that are exhausted in this fight. I mean, we've been trying and hoping for anything that makes sense for for decades, really, my whole life. <laughs> and do, am I looking at this, you know, legalization package, the regulate marijuana like alcohol? Am I looking at that like, oh, yay, this is it? No, I'm not. I definitely am not. 
But to be honest, I never really sat and thought about what legalized marijuana would look like when I was growing up and we were dreaming about it. But I did imagine that it didn't look like a couple of guys getting shot at their farm for having parties and where people were freely smoking marijuana. And I didn't think it would look like, you know, corporate (laughs) marijuana products looking like, you know, basically like a bland pack of Marlboro greens or whatever. You know, I I didn't ever think that that would be it either. As, uh, As a matter of fact, that would be what I thought of as a nightmare of a future dystopian situation. So that's all I got on this, man. I'm trying not to make this super long. Um, go down the rabbit hole in my description below to find out more stuff and read into it more, get the book. And when the movie comes out, I'll let you know, you should definitely go check that out too. Have a good one. Come back for more. Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, hit the, hit the thumbs down. If you don't like it, put a comment below and have a good one.